Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. At first they removed parts of, and eventually they removed all my stomach, all of my esophagus. They took my jejunum, which I'd never heard that word before. In fact, I turned to my wife and I said, did we, did we bring that? What is that? Um, but the, the jejunum is the first part of the intestine below the stomach. There's the duodenum or duodenum, some people say, then the jejunum. But the jejunum does the same thing as when you swallow, there's this downward constriction called peristalsis. The jejunum does the same thing. So when you swallow, it brings it to the stomach, and then when it leaves the stomach, the jejunum brings it on down. So they basically made a new esophagus with my jejunum, which is amazing that they can just kind of Lego, you know, Mr. Potato Head, pull different parts around, that it still works. But so that's kind of, that's how that works. And I know I only say that because there's always somebody who's going to ask, well, how do you eat? Um, so, uh-oh, we got ducks. No pets allowed, Mr. Sharp. So uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of how that works. So I had to kind of turn my focus because I really have no storage. For, you know, the stomach is a, basically a, a storage bag. Um, I have to kind of eat throughout the day. And so I graze and nibble throughout the day. But I also have to kind of watch what I eat. I, um, and for, at first, for me being a chef, I felt very constricted. But then it kind of really just gave me more focus. Like if, if you can play anything on the piano and somebody says, play something, like what you know like there's many options well sometimes having a dietary restriction whether you're gluten intolerant or you're diabetic the first thought is very negative but really it kind of just gives you a little bit of boundaries and that's fine it kind of sharpens your vision so it allows you to play within a space and get really good at that space and not have to worry about the things that um, it's almost like the food version of, or the menu version of the serenity prayer. I don't have to worry about the things that I can't eat, right? I'm just going to focus on the things that I can eat. But what I found is the things that I can eat are really the things that we as humans kind of should focus on anyway, right? Less meat, less sugar, uh, less, uh, you know, sort of saturated uh, fats and oils. So the, the things that I have difficulty with, quite honestly, we all have difficulty with it just in different degrees. So I, I guess that has been sort of the blessing of this is that it's given me that focus, but it also seems to be universally true with a lot of folks. Now, having said that, I'm not a nutritionist, right? I'm a chef. So my, my focus had to shift from quantity because in the States we like to eat lots of food to quality. So I, I, I know a lot about nutrition. I talk about nutrition. I read about nutrition. I, I am the embodiment of nutrition because I have to be, but all of us have our engines are wired somewhat differently. So if you see something and you think that's a good idea, it might not work for you, or it might, especially when we talk about things like beans. If you go from eating a somewhat processed food diet, or even like a fast food diet, to shifting to juicing or eating more greens or eating more vegetables, sometimes there's that adjustment period, right? So sometimes you, like for example, when I was first diagnosed, I went crazy with juicing. And it kind of made me feel sick. And I had to talk to my dietitian and say, what is this? And she goes, well, you, it's like exercising. And started with the 100-pound weight. The next day, I'd be like, oh, my God, I'm allergic to exercise because you would feel miserable. So you have to start sometimes gradually and work your way up to that. So sometimes people get inspired and they think, oh, I'm going to change my diet. And they do it so radically that it's very hard on the body. So you can take some of these ideas that I talk about, and I talk a lot, so sh shut me up at any point. Um, you can take these ideas and incorporate them, fold them in to the way that you eat. It's just don't try to make a, a radical shift without expecting somewhat of a radical feel, you know. But I will say, again, despite missing all of my body parts, I probably pay, play two to three hours of pickleball a day, and I walk three to five miles a day, in addition to doing, uh, I probably do in a day more than most people do. I'm not. I attribute all of that to what I eat. I have so much energy. Now, when I travel, and I'm like, oh, we're going to go through the Wendy's drive-through. No, no shade on Wendy's. Uh, but if I if I kind of put nutrition to the side, excuse me, <clears throat> I feel I, I feel it almost instantly. I just spent the month of June in Germany, where I'm eating sausage and beer almost every day by law. I have to. Um, <laughs> um, 
but I felt a difference, right? I felt, you know, greasy and lethargic and tired and heavy. Um, not weight heavy, but I just felt ugh, my energy was gone. So I, I am so, because my system is so redacted, I feel it's almost instant. And it's almost like sticking your finger, you know, in a, in a pot of boiling water. You feel it. If I eat, if I eat greasy, heavy, you know, overcooked, overprocessed foods, I feel greasy and overcooked and overprocessed and tired. The flip side of that is if I eat healthy, fresh, vibrant foods, I feel healthy, fresh, and vibrant. And again, that is almost instantaneous for me. So for, for you normal gutted people, um, I, like my, my eight-year-old will say, because my stomach hurts, and I'm like, show off. I don't even have a stomach. I don't want to hear about your stomach. Anyway, um, I have a little bit of empathy. I'm, I'm just kidding. But uh, my point being is because digestion, because you have that waiting room, sometimes the you think of the meal you just you just had so if you feel tired and greasy you think, man i just had that burrito i shouldn't have eaten that it might not be the burrito it might have been the thing you had for breakfast right because there's a, there's this time play for me it's almost instant because i'm it's going straight into my system so just keep that in mind too that sometimes the thing that you are associating with feeling tired or heavy or whatever might not be the last thing you ate it might have been the thing you had six or eight or whatever hours ago so that's important now I, I'm not a vegetarian, uh, 100%, but I would say I'm about a 90% vegetarian, only because, again, without stomach acid, I have a hard time digesting meat. It's just hard for me to break it down. So I, I don't think I've cooked meat in a class in probably eight years. I mean, most of the classes I do, I try to either steer away from meat just to show people that you can eat fine without it. Um, and again, I, I ate meat in Germany. It's not that I'm against it. It's just that I, it's hard for me to eat. So today I'm making a chili, which in the South, a lot of people think chili shouldn't have beans. I'm on the other camp. I feel like that chili doesn't need meat. I, this is a bean intensive chili. And today I'm using um, a vegetarian crumble. This one just happens to be the Light Life brand. But there are so many good plant-based crumbles now. Uh, and I have to, so this is my mom, Brenda, by the way. And I, I use her as, a, as my cooking assistant, but she's also my example because she is when you look up picky eater in the dictionary her picture is right there um it used to be she's gotten a lot better at it but so when i would try to sneak in healthy things she's like oh, i don't think i'm gonna like that like tofu at first she's like oh, i'm not gonna like it because if you just took a block of tofu and tried it it is weird right but you also don't take a piece of chicken breast and eat it either i mean a lot of these things require a little bit of massage and prep but there are so many great vegan vegetarian options now that are bean based or plant based that mimic the real thing kind of scary how well they they do um and so we use this a lot in for taco night or for if i'm making uh, a soup or in this case with chili so that's what i'm going to be using today there's no meat in there and as you're eating it you're thinking are you sure this is not meat and i have had people say was this labeled wrong because i would swear this is ground beef or turkey um and it's it's really it's so realistic that my vegetarian daughter ella uh, who some of you might remember from previous classes. She used to help. She lives in Hamburg, Germany now. Um, she doesn't like this because it is so realistic. She's like, oh, it's just, she, ha she hasn't eaten meat since she was eight. So, uh, so anyway, that's, that's what we're using today. And I guess I should actually start doing some cooking. So I will probably hit my head on this. So uh, if, I, if I drop a curse word, I'll go ahead and apologize in advance. <laughs> Uh, my dad was from Germany, and uh, you know when you learn another language, the first thing you learn, if it's not the food, uh, the second thing might be please and thank you, but the curse words are always high on the list of what you learn. And when my dad, um, in, in Germany, curse words aren't so much curse words. Like, I think of curse words almost like cayenne pepper. Like, I'm not going to put cayenne pepper in every dish, but every now and then, a little cayenne pepper kind of makes the point. So... I try not to use them, but occasionally, if I crack my head on this, I might little little cayenne pepper comes out. So I apologize in advance. So um, I'm gonna. I've already made a, a big batch of chili because I have a lot of folks to feed. But I'm gonna show you how ridiculously easy this is. Um, and you can see, and and I've got a recipe. And just a caveat: I hate recipes, uh, but this is a sort of a foundation. When I make chili, it is an excuse to clean out my fridge. So if I have a little stuff to barbecue sauce, I need to get rid of it. Or if I you know, um, some salsa or a little bit of pasta sauce or whatever, I will take a little splash of vinegar and, you know, just get the dregs of it out of there and dump it in. So uh, I love this. And that's what soups are for, too. I mean, they're, they're a great vehicle to 
get rid of these, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're too thrifty to throw it away and you know it's still good, but what am I going to do with it? So this is where these things go. So um, that's the beauty of this. And that's what I think any good uh, cook or chef will tell you is that sometimes, you know, people hate leftovers. I like, I like the idea of leftovers because sometimes leftovers, like we were talking about earlier, like what do I cook? I can, I can cook anything anybody asks me to, but I don't know where to start. So open my fridge and I think, well, I need to get rid of that. Or we got, you know, there's, you know, the end of a, even a leftover hamburger could be crumbled up and put into a chili. So it's a, it's a great way to utilize um, leftovers in a, in a positive way. And it's a universal thing that you can take in any direction. So uh, I love starting with garlic. I put garlic in almost everything. Um, so I've got some olive oil, just enough really so that the, uh, that my, aromatics in this case it's going to be my garlic and onions i got a half an onion diced um, and i'm starting with these because this is going to kind of the term is sweat so um, i'm not sweating but these guys are sweating and that kind of opens up the, all of the volatile oils that are in the the garlic and the onions and that kind of wakes them up if i were to add these at the end it's fine but you're not going to get the same kind in fact in a minute you're going to you're going to smell this because this kind of wakes everything up so as, as my aromatics are, are doing their thing and starting to sweat, now's when I want to add some of the spice and herbs. Because again, especially when you're using dried spices, they're fine and you can add them, but if you can wake them up by either toasting them or sweating them with your, uh, with your aromatics. You know, if you look at like Cajun food, they'll always use uh, garlic and celery and onions and red peppers or green peppers. Uh, in French, they'll use carrots and celery and onions, but there's always some kind of an aromatic that you're, that you're sauteing first. I had a little bit of pepper. These are mild. These are just bell peppers that I was using as a garnish, but I'm too thrifty to throw them away, so where are they going to go? In the chili. Um, so somebody's going to say, well, that's not on the list. Of course it's not on the list. I never use the recipe. Uh, and I'm, the thing about recipes, again, I, I think they're great, but I think of them like driving instructions. Like if, if you were driving to Blue Ridge, which I know you do, there's like six ways I could send you. And are you in a hurry? Do you want to go through the wine country? Do you want to go by the marble quarries? So it depends on, it's the same with cooking. I mean, I love the process of cooking. I put on a podcast, I, or I put on some music. It's kind of my time in the kitchen. And I, sometimes I have people come to me and it's like, well, tell me, how do I, how do I spend less time in the kitchen? I have my time and I get to kind of, I enjoy the prep and the chopping and whatever. I mean, I, I turned it, after spending so many weeks, 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 and months in the hospital, what I wouldn't give to be back in the kitchen rather than in a hospital hooked up to IV, right? So this is my time on my playground to experiment and have fun. And, and if somebody doesn't like it, they can go eat somewhere else. I mean, um, so embrace the time is what, I, is what I'm saying. But the, uh, you learn from making mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. The, the net sum of all the ingredients I have in this dish is probably less than $6, $8 at the most. And so the worst thing that happens is it goes in the trash can. You have learned to never do that again, right? So sometimes you have to hit that wall to know what are the boundaries. Um, so as I'm adding some things, I'll, I'll share a quick story. So I'm adding here, this is a spice blend that I make called Lucky 7. And this is, um, it's got things like coriander and cumin and cumin is really the, the spice that I love and, and uh, there's a little bit of cinnamon in here not much but you'll smell it in a second it's it's really good in chili it's also really good with anything green uh, but if you don't need that you can use uh, a little cumin or again as I, what I have on there oregano works well in there uh, and then I'm also going to put this is remember I mentioned how I put barbecue sauce sometimes this is a dry barbecue rub that I make called honey buzz um, that's got smoked paprika, a little bit of coriander, a little bit of uh, orange peel, um, and a little bit of honey powder. So a little, little sweetness. So it's, it's dehydrated honey. So I don't know if you can smell this yet. I definitely can. Uh, but I could have added all these things at the end and it would be about 20% of what flavor I'm going to get out of it by sweating it ahead of time. So that, this is really the bulk of the cooking. It's just getting those things sweated. Now I've already... Uh, all three of my beans. So I've got kitty beans and dark red uh, kitty beans and um, chickpeas or garbanzo beans. 
And again, don't go straight from the can. It's going to look like I'm going straight from the can, but we've already taken them out, rinsed them. I just put them back in here so you could see the measurement. I never measure anything. So this is as close to measuring as it comes. Uh, and if you like um, rehydrating your own beans, go for it. And that's a great way to do it. Just make sure you change the water out. The, the reason really, it's not that the liquid in the can is inedible. It's that if you have problems with gas, it's usually the, the soaking liquid or the liquid that's in the can. That's that first where the sort of gas resides. So the more you rinse it, um, the more that that's not going to be an issue. And just like we talked about with exercise, the more you eat beans, the more that is not a problem. I mean, we're all adults, but we can still be third graders when we're talking about gas and bowel movements. Um, but I mean, honestly, anybody dealing with health, if your bowels aren't happy, you aren't happy. I mean, right? So we, you sort of have to address that. Um, so beans have that reputation, but I eat beans every single day. I do not to overshare, uh, but I don't have that problem. And I don't have that problem because as you change your diet, like we were talking about earlier, your entire gut microbe like the whole probiotic your the bacteria that live in your gut change i mean it literally is a it's sort of this revolution of of the good bacteria taking over so as you eat more you know dark leafy greens or or beans or uh grains your your gut gets better prepared and acclimated for for eating those kind of things so um eat more eat more grains eat more beans it's, it's good stuff now, this has already been cooked and browned. Um, sometimes you get different versions of these that need to be browned first. Like I said, this one I like because it's straight out of the package. You can see it's already nice and ready to eat. There's nothing, uh, uh, nothing in here that's, you know, that's undercooked or uncooked. You could eat it straight from this. Not that it's, not that I would. Um, but if I were cooking this in stages, I would still do the garlic, the spice, whatever first. And then add, even if you're making, if you're making this with turkey or, or ground beef or, or ground chicken, I would still get your aromatics and your herbs going first and then your, and your onions and whatnot, and then go in. You'll find that this, the, uh, the meat or the, the meat substitute doesn't stick to the pan as much if you get it going with your onions and garlic and stuff first. You are, you've already kind of created this, this layer that nothing wants to stick to. So that would be the, that would be the order in which I would do that if I needed to cook these grounds or the or the beet or the meat um all right so in we go with that and now really it's just about sort of finessing the sauce now i mentioned on the uh on the little recipe there so I usually i use fire roasted crushed tomatoes um I, we live in jasper georgia they don't always have the exact ingredients that i want which is fine because with chili you can change it so i've got crushed tomatoes and i've also got some tomato sauce um and I, I think, to me, what makes a great chili is the sauce. You can throw grains and beans and, you know, whatever meat or chicken or whatever you want to put into here. If the sauce isn't good, that's what defines the chili. So that's what you really want to have the right consistency, the right flavor. And the great thing is you can tweak it. Uh, you can, you know, if you feel like it needs salt, you add salt. Now, I will say, in a group like this, I tend to undersalt because salt is something that we all have kind of our own personal threshold of, of what salt is. So I have, a, I have a salt grinder here. If you feel like it needs more salt, I'm not one of those crazy chefs that's going to get offended. But I do tend to undersalt things. To me, once you taste salt, you've gone too far. Uh, salt is a natural extract, and it kind of helps bring out the flavor. If you've ever eaten like an underripe piece of melon, uh, and you know, my, my aunt, uh, or I guess my great aunt, your aunt, always ate salt on a green plum or on you know, underripe watermelon. And I thought it was so weird as a kid, but when you try it, it really does bring out something in an underripe piece of fruit. Uh, and that's just an example of how salt really is a powerful flavor enhancer or extractor. But once you actually are tasting salt, you've kind of gone too far. So just a little goes a long way. There's some salt in here uh, from the spices that I did. But I, again, I typically tend to undersalt because each of us can always add salt. It's easier to add it than it is to take it away. But if you do oversalt it, well, then you add more liquid. You know, this is kind of the rule of cooking. That's why I don't, I uh, can't, really, can't really play like that with baking because the whole cake's going to flop, I know from experience. Um, now, the, the kind of odd, but this is already looking great. I mean, this is really, I have judged a lot of uh, chili cook-offs in my, in my day. I get roped into being the celebrity judge for these things. And there's a, there's a wide spectrum of what people call chili. Some good, most not so much. Um, and some so spicy you can't even think. I mean, you know, it's 
So I, I tend, again, to be lower on the spice side, but one of the tricks that people do um, in chili cook-offs is they add peanut butter to chili. So if you ever enter a chili cook-off, I'm looking for that because peanut butter gives it a beautiful kind of glossiness, but just like the salt, if I taste peanut butter in there, I don't want peanut butter chili. Uh, I'm, I'm very open to like, you know, savory and peanut butter, but I don't really like peanut butter in my chili. So I know that trick. So don't, uh, if I'm judging, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the peanut butter. Uh, so the one weird thing on here is curry ketchup. You don't need curry ketchup. With a name like Hans, obviously the little German, uh, German going on there. If you've ever been to Berlin, this is kind of a very Berlin thing. And it really is what the name, it's ketchup with curry powder in it. And it is so not German, it's hysterical that it, it's only found in Germany. Um, but that's just, Berlin is one of those melting pot cities with a lot of uh, people from all over the world. And curry ketchup is, uh, and I'll, I can pass this around, you can get it at Whole Foods and uh, any of these international markets around. It is really good. There is a spicy version, which I don't, I can't do much spice, but this one's a very mild version. My kids love it. It's got the right amount of sweetness with just a little bit of spice. So nothing, uh, nothing over the top. And even people who say they don't like curries usually love curry ketchup. So I'm going to throw it about, uh, because I used a little extra tomato sauce, I'm probably going to put about half a cup in there. And again, I don't measure anything. Um, but I'm going to leave this here. You're welcome to, uh, to try that or look at it or whatever. But you don't have to have curry. Don't go out and buy it for your chili. I'm sure you have something in your fridge you need to get rid of. Um, so don't feel like you have to go and buy curry ketchup. I'm not sponsored by the curry ketchup people. <laughs> Although it's a good idea now that I think about it. Maybe, maybe I need to reach out to those folks. Um, so again, this is, we're, we're basically done. Uh, and the great thing about this is it holds in the fridge for easily a week. Not that it'll last that long. It is great in a baked potato or a baked sweet potato or on... Uh, on rice, um, but or in today's case, what I'm going to do, in fact, let me get it out of the oven. Um, I, again, I'm always trying to get protein into my, into my diet. And the people immediately think meat when you think protein, like that's the go-to. Well, the reality is a steak might have 22 grams of protein in it, but the reality is you're only probably getting a fraction of that, even if you have a completely intact digestive system. It's a very think of it almost like it's being padlocked, right? It's a very uh, hard thing for our body to get all of that protein out. Plant-based protein, on the other hand, is easier to uh, absorb, it's easier to extract, uh, it's easier on the gut, it helps build that healthy gut biome that we talked about. And uh, so I'm always looking for ways to, to work in more healthy plant-based protein. So rather than using white rice, which I love, I mean, white rice is good stuff, but nutritionally, it's kind of a bit of a desert. Not much going on with white rice. And brown rice sometimes can be, at least for my, my kids, too chewy. I mean, I love it, but it, it is very chewy and dense. So I try to use alternates. And so in this case, let me turn this down. Um, and again, I, I go to my pantry and I say, what do I have? Because I... Much to my Virgo wife's chagrin, she likes everything in one place. And I come back and I'm like, oh, look what I found. And it drives her crazy. But the gluten-free spectrum uh, for today. But there, if you don't have problems with uh, farro and frica and um, wheat berries, based grains that you can use, and those tend to be as you get into the, the gluten-free variety, there's whole grain sorghum, which is what we're using today. And this is the bag, and I've also got some that have already cooked here. Uh, there's millet, which is in millet bird feed. They're smart. They eat good stuff. So um, we are eating millet today. We are eating bird seed. Um, and so millet, especially like in India and Pakistan, they, uh, they eat a lot of, of cooked millet. Super, super nutritious. The sorghum, by the way, is, let's see, four grams of protein. Millet's about the same. Uh, they People know quinoa. Quinoa is a, an excellent, um, truly, it's a complete protein. It has all the amino acids that our body can't produce. Quinoa is, it is a superfood for a reason. It is fantastic. And it's so versatile. I mean, I can eat it, you can eat it for breakfast. You can make it sweet or savory. Uh, and then um, there's teff, which is eaten in uh, Ethiopian food. It's very tiny, like smaller than a grain of sand. And then I just found this one recently called Fanyo, and it only takes five minutes to cook. And Fanyo has three grams of protein as well. And all of these are very similar to a rice type thing. 
So what I do is I will cook the entire bag of whatever it is, keep it in the fridge, and then in the morning if I'm wanting like an oatmeal type thing, I can take a, a bowl of uh, these combined, and I, I like to combine them sometimes, like this one's big, this one's small, the small ones sometimes can kind of kind of clump together, but if I add some of the larger, whether it's quinoa or, or sorghum, if you add them together, they tend to not stick together, get mushy. So by, I'd like to kind of mix them together. Plus, as you're eating it, you don't feel like you're just eating gruel. You know, sometimes you have a, I want two packs of oatmeal, and then you're just like halfway through, you're like, oh my God, I, I'm just eating the same thing over and over again. But when you have different textures, it kind of keeps you engaged. And when, when nutrition, especially when you're going through treatment, when I was going through chemo and radiation, as much as I love food, I didn't want food, right? It just, everything was so different. But if I had different textures, it kind of kept me interested in eating. So, um, but again, in the morning, if I want something for breakfast, I can, you know, I can make a fried egg on top of it. Or if I wanted something sweet, I could take a couple of these with some craisins or some uh, almonds or walnuts with a drizzle of honey on top. So you can make a, you can do something interesting with it. What I always tell people, like the cooking instructions, it takes about an hour to cook the sorghum. Sometimes when I'm hungry, I need to eat, like, soon right you know sometimes my blood sugar starting to crash i need to eat something well if it's going to take me an hour to cook this i'm probably going to go for something prepackaged and convenient because i don't have an hour i need to eat but if i have these things ready i am more likely than to go or, or again cook an egg with this in there so having these on the ready and you can freeze them so if i if i cook the entire bag and you think how am i going to eat all that well I'll keep half in the fridge and half up bring it out you know I'll, I'll use it as i need it um, so what I did was, essentially, instead of doing rice, uh, I basically made a nice big thing, and you can see the steam coming off for our chili. So not only are we getting protein from three different types, and the, the crumble, the, the bean-based crumble that's in there, we also have a platform of protein. So without really trying much, just by making smarter selections, I've, I've created this protein bomb that is easy to, uh, easy to digest, and that's that's the way I start looking. Uh, you know, when you start looking at nutrition, again, that, and I've talked to other people that aren't professionals, but they love cooking. But once when I start thinking about nutrition, it becomes too academic. It's too, it takes the sort of sexiness and the fun out of cooking. I, I think the opposite. I now look at each ingredient as an opportunity. You know, so I, I'm, just because the recipe says add something, why am I adding that thing? Does it, does it add flavor? Does it add texture? Does it add nutrition? And if it doesn't, why is it there? And you'll find that so many, as you start looking at with that, that pair of glasses, you'll find there's a lot of arbitrary stuff that doesn't need to be in certain things. So I, I tend to go for simple, you know, there's the whole keep it simple and stupid. Um, I like that. Keep, you know, the, the human brain can only identify maybe seven or eight true flavors. And after that, it starts to get kind of gray like white noise so i'd rather have fewer ingredients that make sense to have in there that at the end of the day have a, a positive effect on the body and if i can check all those boxes i've won you know and, and if it tastes good on top of that which let's be honest if it doesn't taste good you're not going to eat it um so that's that is of course is high on the list um, but i want it to taste good i want it to be nutritious and i want it to uh, be visually appealing um, but easy, especially again, if, if you are a caregiver or you're a patient, it's got to be user friendly. Otherwise, again, otherwise, what's the point? So, uh, let's start, uh, making food and, uh, questions, anybody? I know I run my mouth nonstop. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Like right. Well, so that, that's a great question, and Emily can, can address that too. It's just like with anything. You have to be smart because there are some, uh, like I like, there's impossible and there is beyond. Uh, and I'm just talking about like as a hamburger substitute, right? Just using those two as an example. One of them is a list of ingredients like that long, and the other one is like four or five things that I recognize, right? So with anything, I mean, just, just for example, if you go to buy a tub of yogurt, you can buy yogurt that has four ingredients or you can buy yogurt that has 40 ingredients. So within the spectrum of those meatless things, there are good ones and bad ones. And that really kind of comes down to doing a little bit of homework. And I, and I don't want to say that I endorse one or the other, but I have found that there are, I mean, I like the Light Life brand. Um, 
it, I just try to think, do I know what this is? And if it's, if it's a word that's that long, I try to, I try to ignore it. Uh, because you're right, there, the industry has gotten so excited about shifting to plant-based that some of them, their concern is not about nutrition, it's more about riding this wave of popularity right now of this plant-based thing. Um, so that, that's a great question and there's not one answer for it other than you just have to kind of do, not, on, not necessarily research, but when you're at the grocery store, just look at both of them. Which one, what makes sense? You know, this one has about 10 ingredients uh, in there. Things like, uh, you know, potato starch and uh, smoked sugar and, you know, uh, vegetable juice. So uh, wheat gluten, of course, there's soy in there. Uh, so this is a handful of ingredients, whereas, and, and I'm, not, I'm not ragging on beyond, but beyond the ingredients looks like you need a PhD to understand what it is. And I'm not saying that it's bad. I just, again, going back to the keep it, keep it simple and stupid, would my grandparents recognize it as food? And, you know, some of these things, I don't even recognize it as food. You know, when I had my feeding tube, and again, if I say a brand name, it's not that I'm endorsing it or not endorsing it, but the hospital by default gives you Nestle. There's not a single ingredient on that fluid that they were feeding me with in the Nestle that is food, not one, other than water. There's not one thing in there that's food. So I did some research and found a company called Kate Farms where it's all food and it's things that you would eat. They've just liquefied it and put it in the bag. And so insurance paid for both of them. But I, as a consumer, had to say, hey, I don't want the one that's things I don't recognize. I, I want the food. So sometimes it just takes us doing our homework and, and speaking up that that's what we want. We can go ahead and start. To, so what I want to do is get, um, we need to get a scoopy spoon here. Let's see. Anytime I'm in a new kitchen. Now, to me, this feels like the same kitchen that we were in last time, but on a different floor. Um, doesn't it? I mean, it feels, it feels kind of the same. Um, I love barley. Barley would be great. It'd be, barley would be great in this, or it would be good on uh, on there. But barley does, by default, have gluten, which again, gluten gets so villainized. Um, if you have a gluten sensitivity, people have peanut allergies. Some people have gluten allergies. I think, and not to go off on a wild tangent, people became afraid of of gluten. Why don't we mix the two of these? Um, people became afraid of gluten because everything is like, well, everybody's wanting gluten free. And what people found was when they switched to a gluten free diet, they started losing weight. It's not because of the gluten. It's just they were paying attention to what they were eating and they were eating less refined foods, less white breads and, and those kind of things. So, uh, but barley is one of those that, um, that is a gluten, glutinous plant or whatever. Uh, but I love it. I mean, I love barley in soup. Again, I love it in chili. It is a, it is a great, it is a great grain. I tend to undercook them just slightly uh, because, again, again I, I use them for different purposes. Barley, if you overcook it, really a ladle would be better for this and maybe a spoon for that. Um, hmm. <laughs> we got all sorts of things in here. I feel like this came from a surgical... Uh... Are we sure, Emily, that this is in the right department? Uh, wait, hang on. I, I, got a better, I got a better show and tell. Um, what is this? Like who, what, what medieval torture device did this thing come from? I have never seen a knife like that. That is wicked. Uh, uh, that looks good. That looks good. We'll have plenty. So if anybody wants more, that's fine. And then I want to put, um, if, if we can get one more person to come help plates, that would be good. Otherwise we're going to be doing this for a while. I want to do a, um, strip of pepper and a little piece of thyme on there and then we're good to go. Um, where was I going? So I, I tend to undercook grains, the sort of, not undercook to the point where it'll break your teeth, but I don't want it to get mushy. And barley is one of those that can get really mushy really fast. So like if the cooking directions is, you know, 15 minutes, I start checking it at 12. I still want it to have, almost like when you do pasta, you want it to be al dente. I like my grains to be a little bit al dente because I'm usually gonna end up heating them a second time. So if I'll cook a big batch, I tend to undercook them. Now with barley, you can get the um, par cooked barley, just pay attention. I've made the mistake of or the quick cook barley. The quick cook barley is great for soups, and soups but if you want it to be separate, kind of like how I have the sorghum, you have to get the regular barley because the quick cook is um, it, it gets mushy quick. Which mushy is not a bad thing. It's just depending on what, this. This is the sorghum. That's the whole grain sorghum. Yeah. 
And that brand, Bob's Red Mill, that's a brand that just does a good job. It's all, they, they do a good job of not cross-contaminating. They're clean. But you can also go to stores that do some of that work for you. So people pick on Whole Foods for being too expensive. I don't, I don't think it's that much more expensive than Kroger, for example. But when I go into a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's, they have the same sort of food values that I do. And so I don't have to go to the fish department and ask, is this sustainable? Has this been farm raised properly? Does this have growth hormones or antibiotics? Because they've already asked those questions for me. So I'm not saying you have to shop at those places all the time, but I, I love going to some of the um, like uh, Super H Mart or Nam De Moon. There's a lot of great little uh, international grocery stores and I'm not saying they don't do it right. Sometimes their produce is better, but I have to ask the question. You know, they haven't made it as a policy. This, we as a store are not buying. Um, there are great things in all the stores. You just have to do a little more homework. But once you are in a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's, and Aldi to a degree, Aldi and Trader Joe's are the, really the same company. Um, they do a good job of, uh, of filtering out some of the stuff that you wouldn't want to eat. So, and you a premium for that sometimes but you also would pay a, a, a food counselor or a private chef or whatever so i think it's worth the 10 percent extra that you might pay sometimes so oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah jump in yeah yeah sorry i'm running my mouth and the uh, food's getting as i said i'm good at running my mouth i'm good i'm back okay good i'll start peppering here any other questions well while, while i'm plating up here uh, so again, that's that's the honey buzz. Yeah, that's it. That's just sprinkled on top. That's it. Yeah. Uh, and again, this was designed to be a dry barbecue rub. So, gosh, 15, 18 years ago, I was so frustrated when I wanted to go and buy a dry barbecue rub, like we talked about. It was a list of ingredients that long. And I'm like, I just want something sweet, something smoky, something, you know. And so I just made my own. And in fact, I found the granulated honey at Super H Mart. And I'd never seen dehydrated honey. And its ingredient was literally it's just honey that had, was dehydrated. And so that became the base. And then I added smoked salt and uh, smoked paprika and a little orange peel, a little coriander. So it's got five ingredients in there, but it's what I wanted out of a dry barbecue rub. But I, of course, now use it in all sorts of other things. But um, So I'll talk about the spices for a second. All of these I started doing because, again, I was frustrated with the spices. And I'm not necessarily here to sell spices. They're here if you want them. Um, but there is a, an Indian spice blend, garam masala, that I use a lot in greens. And so I tweaked that a little bit. That became Lucky 7. So that's good on anything green or, again, it's, it's in our chili today. It's got cumin and coriander and, and a little pepper, a little cinnamon. Honey bows we just talked about. The salt that I use every single day at my house is called Out of the Blue, named after my friend's gourmet shop in Blue Ridge. It has sea salt, coriander, white pepper, and lavender flowers which can be bitter if you have too many of them. But, um, so I use this coarse in cooking, and then I use it in a grinder as a finishing salt. So if I'm on my eggs in the morning, I use it you know, in a grinder for that. So that's out of the blue. And I've got them here, and I also have them in grinders. And then um, I've got Sugar Baby, which is raw turbinado sugar with ginger, cardamom, and cinnamon. This is awesome on apples or on your oatmeal. Uh, but there is sugar in there, so you know if you watch your sugar levels. But if you like cinnamon sugar, this is like elevated cinnamon sugar. And I've got a fifth spice that I'm out of right now called Cajun Joe, which is kind of a spicy one. Um, but anyway, those those are here if anybody wants them. What time of dish would you put your? Any I use salt, I mean you're gonna. Ask mom, uh, we use it on any time I reach for salt. I either reach for this course, whether I'm cooking vegetables or, or whatever or pasta. But or in or I grind it. I mean, so again, you could get one of these you know, if you already have a grinder. You use my finishing salt. It just salt tastes like salt. has that little bit extra in there. Oh, and I just mentioned this too. I do a I do a nerdy fi, uh, food podcast called But I Digest, uh, and my co-host. I was on the Next Food Network star in 2005. My co-host was uh, one of the winners of that show. Uh, named Steve McDonough, and we do a kind of a deep dive into an ingredient, and then we talk about this histories, its heroes, and sort of the, the hoopla or the, the culture surrounding food. And they're funny, and they're nerdy, and whatever. So if you like podcasts, pick up one of these. It's got a little QR code on the back, so you can listen to it. But we've done 37 episodes, I guess, so far. Um, they come out every other week. This week's episode is on pretzels. So it's the it's weird history of pretzels. And, 
So, but there's always some kind of fun pop culture reference and trivia and whatever. So, uh, that's my that's my fun. In in the pandemic, when I didn't have people that I could talk my nerdy food stuff about, I basically had to go to the internet and start talking that way. So, uh, so I'm I'm curious as you eat this. Uh, if anybody, number one, feels like they're missing meat, like if they, oh, this would be better if it had meat, uh, and then what your thoughts are on the actual crumble, like, you know, the texture and whatever. Many, I mean, some of you probably have had that before, but. I feel like I can shrink my head. Well, you know, it's funny you say that, it, because uh, I know a lot of folks that have been doing that as a uh, subversive kind of a way. For whatever reason, again, it is so ingrained in our culture that meat equals protein, protein equals meat. And so people feel like, well, I gotta eat meat, I gotta have a meat and two veg. The reality is if we could, if we could make, instead of 80% meat and 20% veg, if, if you could just flip flop the numbers, and I'm not saying 100% give up meat, but if you can make it 80% veg and grains and 20% meat, you'll notice a difference in your, in your weight, in your energy, in your, again, sorry to talk about bowels as you're eating lunch, but in bowels, uh, all of that is interconnected just for making that switch from meat to veg. Um, and you will find that, um, that you don't miss it. I mean, you don't miss it at all. I, mean, I definitely do not miss the feeling of, you know, I, I was 225 pounds before my surgery. I'm 135 soaking wet now. What I, of course I miss being able to just eat what I want. Um, and I can eat, for the most part, I can eat what I want. I mean, I just have to be in this. I don't miss the feeling of having to unbutton my my jeans and push back. Like, oh my god! Like I didn't stop eating until I was miserable. I mean, truly, like miserable. Uh, and not to overshare, I went to my best friend's bachelor party and we went to dinner. First, and I'm like, I want to go home and take a nap. Like I don't want to go to festivities. I just want to go take a nap because I felt pretty shallow, you know, that Brazilian house place. And we, you pay like fifty bucks, and so then you feel guilty, like. Well, I spent 50 bucks, I better eat all this, and then you, you just feel miserable. I don't miss that miserable relationship with food. Um, I don't go to buffets, because, I mean, again, with no storage, it's no point of me going to buffets, but I don't miss that. And, and somehow we got to this um, point where it was quality behind quantity. We put quantity as our, look how much food they give us at this pasta place by Printer Mall. We're impressed by that, but then we're miserable. You know, so it's... It's nice when you can shift that, you know, it's almost like the poles reverse and now you're putting quality on top because you don't need that. But it's okay to go to a restaurant and order two appetizers or, or you know, order two appetizers and, and split a meal. Or, you know, um, I just traveled to Florida with my family and my 22-year-old son, you know, he's 22 and so you think, oh, he's a growing boy, he needs to eat a lot. We shared a Reuben sandwich and because uh, I do love a good Reuben, that's one of my, that's one of my perks from time to time. But... Half was plenty for me, and it was also plenty for him. He was like, you know what? I feel great. I don't feel, if he'd eaten the whole sandwich, he said, I, I would have felt miserable. You know, so it is okay. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a trend in the 90s, and we saw it in the restaurant industry. People would ask for a to-go box as soon as their food landed on the table. And they would cut their meal in half, and they would take half and put it in a to-go box. It was a, in the early 90s. That was a trend. And I think it's a great idea, uh, because then you have a meal for... Maybe even later that day, or maybe even later that night. You're not, but you're not cramming it all at once. Or you've got a meal the next day. Or in our household, if you fry an egg on top of it, it's breakfast, right? Whatever it is. Um, that's the way my dad was. You just let's ah, fry an egg on top. It's breakfast. Um, and we still do that in our house. But anyway, it is okay to not stuff yourself. So it is okay when somebody comes by. Would you like sex? God, this is perfect. I'm done. Um, but culturally, we feel guilty. Like, okay, well, she's offering more. I got to eat more. You know, well, Aunt Lily made this, this, uh, you know, cake. I got to eat it. No, you don't. You just, let me have a bite of yours. You take a bite, and you're done. You know, so you are allowed to sort of set your own boundaries. Um, and it's easy for a guy with no stomach to say that. But in hindsight, I like I said, I miss my stomach. I guess. Um, I mean, I miss the freedom that I had when I had it. You know, but. I, uh, I don't miss that feeling. And, and the reality is no one ever held a gun to my head and said you had to eat this. I did it because, you know, it, it's, it's easier to just say, okay, I'll eat it. Uh, and you, we also have that clean plate award, like nobody wants to leave food on the plate because you're just take it with you, take it home, you know? So it's a, it becomes a mindset. And, and like I said, the, the nutrition can sometimes be almost like a bad word. Oh, it's healthy. I don't want to order off the healthy menu. I get excited about it because you can, I mean, I hope you're enjoying it. It's, it's one of those things that you can take 
a dish, almost any dish, and make a healthier version of it. Um, and be just fine. I didn't even I didn't even taste this for salt. If anybody needs salt, I got a giant grinder. You're welcome to it. Like I said, you're not hurting my feelings. And I also didn't season the grains at all, uh, because again, whatever grains I have left over, that can turn anything. So I find that unless I know I'm going to use 100% of it, if I'm making a batch of grains, if I'm cooking the whole bag, it is neutral. And then from there, I can go any direction I want to. If I salted the water when I'm cooking it, I'm now locked into making something savory, right? So I tend to, it's almost like when back in the day of, of um, old masters, the Rembrandts and, and uh, those guys, they had to make their own paints, right? So when they wanted to paint something, before tubes of paint, they would have to crush those things and mix them with the linseed oil. And so before they were able to do something, they had to make it. So I am not comparing myself to Rembrandt at all. Um, and I've got one more ear than Van Gogh. Uh, but this is the same kind of a thing. By, by cooking the whole bag of grains, I'm making, I'm making my paints, right? And so then when I'm hungry, I can go to the fridge and take those things and make something within moments as opposed to waiting for an hour for this to cook or waiting for whatever. So I like to have these things on the ready. And even when I'm doing dried beans, I will soak the whole beans and I'll cook the whole beans, whatever, and then I'll send some down the hill to my mom to eat or I'll put some in the freezer. But it's better for me to have those things on hand and then when I'm hungry, because again, I've, I've got, um, but I think anybody with a health issue, sometimes you have a very narrow window when it's time to eat, right? Or even if it's a time constraint, by having those things on the ready, you just put them together and you can eat them. And I guarantee you with these same ingredients, I can make a kick-ass cold salad. And I do that all the time where I make a bean and bean and grain salad with, you know, some chopped up arugula or spinach and a little quick vinaigrette. There's your lunch. But, I, you know, it, it takes me three minutes to make a healthy salad as opposed to an hour and a half um, by having some. Same with the onion. You know, if I'm dicing an onion, dice the whole onion, you know, which I obviously didn't do in this case. But... Um, I needed half an onion for this recipe, but if I were home, I would dice the whole onion, keep the, keep the other half in a little deli cup or in a you know, glass container, and then I've got half an onion done. So, so yeah. now listen, this is, today you're having a clementine, right? But, yeah, sugar is definitely an issue. And uh, so, me, with, um, with no stomach, my body sends out what it thinks is the right amount of insulin. So if I eat something sweet, I get this wave of insulin, which is way too much for this reduced system. So I always tell people, what is the best bite of dessert? It's the first bite, right? So you get a big $9 piece of cheesecake and it's giant and you're like, wow. And the first bite is, oh my God, this is amazing. The 15th bite, you're like, oh my God, what was I thinking, right? So I let, we order one dessert for the table. I have a first bite and I'm done. Like, to, you know, I start at the top and that's where I draw the line. And do I kind of want more? Yeah, but I know that I just took the best bite of the whole thing, right? So I, uh, I eat a lot of fruits. Um, I eat a lot of yogurt kind of things, a little drizzle of honey, yogurt. And again, even this with some nuts and whatever, a little drizzle of honey and some yogurt, it's perfect. Um, but I usually it's a one or two or three bites at the most, uh, and I'm done. So really simple. And I grow figs. I grow a lot of figs. I probably grew 80 pounds of figs this year. Uh, I have 12 trees, and so I'm eating fresh figs or dried figs or frozen figs. Um, I've got an apple tree, so it, uh, well, like I said, I've got 12 different varieties, you know, Kadotas and Ishias and Teles, and uh, I can nerd out on figs. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a Facebook group called Fig Addicts, and I'm, uh, I'm on the Fig Addict. I, don't have, I have no addictions other than to figs. Um, but anyway, so, so again, three figs, I'm great. It, it, it's sweet, it's fulfilling. I feel like there was also in the 90s a study that once we eat a bite of sweet, that kind of signals the brain that that's the end of the meal. You know, you just psychologically feel like I'm done, which is why I'm not doing a dessert today, but I brought a clean time because then you eat your chili, you have your savory, and then you eat a bite of something sweet, and then your brain kind of says, all right, we're good. It sort of it checks that box. So um, having some grapes in hand or a kiwi, or something, I think it's great to have something simple where you can have a bite and then you're not going to go for the cheesecake or the... And I'm not trying to villainize those things. I love a good cheesecake, but, you know, in, in moderation. Yes, ma'am? How did you become interested in cooking? How long have you been? So, again, I, I was raised literally, I mean, we 12 and a half steps above a restaurant. So I have a very weird childhood because as a kid, when I was hungry, I would walk downstairs into our restaurant and order a French onion soup or a Wiener schnitzel or a, so I, I had a, like normal kids, right? 
Um, so I have a, you know, a very weird childhood. So I never had to cook. I had not cooked an egg in my life until I was 18 years old. And at that point, my dad was diagnosed with a, a kidney disease, and he uh, was on the list for a kidney transplant, and he was still cooking in our restaurant, but hooked up to dialysis. So he, was, he would have the dialysis pole with the bags, and he literally had a, much like Mr. Sharp's walking stick, he had a walking stick that he would sit on a stool, and he would get the eyes that he could reach, and then if he wanted to push the pot off the eye, he would take a stick and push it off. Um, and so I watched that, and we, again, at that point, we thought my dad's going to die soon. And I thought, how, how sad that I have lived in a restaurant my entire life, and I couldn't, can't cook an egg. So I went to him saying, I want to learn how to cook. Not as an occupation, not as a, I just, it's a skill set I thought. I, you know, he was known regionally as one of the best in the business, and still, people still talk about my dad and his food and his hospitality sense, and I thought, how stupid that I never learned this. So I went to him and said, I want to learn it. Well, after the first night in the kitchen with him, he went to my mom and said, there's no chance. He has, there's no chance. He has no, no way this kid is ever going to figure this stuff out. And so I wanted to impress my girlfriend, now wife, so I, it, I guess it worked or she's just, you know, stubborn. But um, so I, I got interested and I grew up watching Yan Can Cook and Julia Childs and Justin Wilson and Graham Kerr, the Galloping Gourmet, right? So those were my cartoons because these were people that were enjoying food and having fun with it but as opposed to downstairs it was stress and chaos and uh but these guys were like enjoying food but i didn't know how to do it but i'd never done it but i watched those shows growing up so i think with, with food television people watch people just magically putting these things together and they think oh that's you know that's that looks great and then they try it and they're afraid to make a mistake but anybody on those television shows will tell you I learned this because I hit that wall. I made that terrible dish. I burned that, you know, thing. You know, I turned away thinking, oh, it'll be fine. And you were like, oh, I burned it. And then by the time you spend an hour scraping all the remnants out of there, you will not make that mistake again. And so people are afraid because they want it to just voila, be this beautiful, you know, photo-worthy dish. You, gotta, you have to suffer through some of the bad dishes. Um, and I have done that. I've, I've definitely done uh, my dad. What a test. I um, but so, yeah, so I, I grew up in it, and as a kid, you always rebel against what your dad does, and so I thought, I'm not doing that, and so I went off and I designed games for a while, um, but as I, I, I just learned that I'm really good at it, and I was great, and I still love people, and I love hospitality, and um, when I go to a restaurant, and I was talking with some folks earlier, whether it's Waffle House, Cracker Barrel, uh, you know, I can enjoy that if the and we have, you know, somebody refills my iced tea, and hospitality is such an easy way to connect with people and make memories and what you can't spell hospitality without the word hospital I try to bring that to the hospital now too and I so I've been doing some talking with like at MD Anderson or at uh, Piedmont and I've not really spent much time with Northside but I think sometimes the nurses forget that they have to have some hospitality it's not patient 655127 it's mr jones how are you how are you feeling it's you know too often it's just people checking boxes and looking at charts and whatever and not even saying good morning you know did you sleep okay they, we're, they forget that hospitality that should the word hospital should be the the epicenter of hospitality because you have people that are compromised they're not feeling well they're recovering from surgery and and i know it's a it's it's an incredibly stressful thing but those simple principles that my Waffle House, I will drive eight miles out of the way to go to my favorite Waffle House because of a guy named Greg there who, even if I'm not in his station, he makes it a point. Not because it's me, he does it to everybody. How are you? Yeah, it's good to see you again, even if you maybe never saw him before. But he's, he makes you feel welcome. And that's, to me, at the essence of hospitality and why I love it, which is why during the pandemic I felt like a caged animal. I just wanted to be with people. I'm, I, that's, the, that's, the, that's my element. Um, so again, we, we all can do that every day, you know, whether, whether it's in a professional or a personal sense, you can say something nice to somebody to make their day. It's so free and easy to craft an experience where somebody will remember you because you said something personal to them. And I, particularly in healthcare, I think that we missed that opportunity. I'm not in healthcare, but I, in, indirectly, um, I have, I have a nurse that was from, uh, from Thailand that knew that I was a chef and after one of my most horrific surgeries, I mean, it was really brutal. She brought in fresh mint and basil because she knew I was a chef. She brought it in from her home garden so that my room would remind. She didn't have to do that. I mean, I got chill bumps just thinking about it. She didn't have to do that. 
I will remember that until the day I take my last breath because that person took a moment. It cost her nothing. She literally picked weeds from her garden. I mean, if you have mint, you know, once you got mint, it's a weed. So she literally picked weeds from her garden, brought them into my room, and it transformed a miserable experience into something positive. I'm, again, I'm getting myself chill bumps. Um, and one of us has the power to do that every single day. So I don't know how I went from chili to hospitality. <laughs> so, which is why, again, I tend to digress, which is why the name of the podcast is But I Digest. Um, so it's because we, do, we, we make those kind of wild sweeps. And Anyway. Any other questions? I think I'm going beyond mm -hmm. my uh, allotted time, but. I have a question like this, a shogun you have here. Mm -hmm. I use shogun flour a lot, mm -hmm. but when you are, uh, this grain, when you are cooking it, is better to soak it before cooking? Yes. Um, so, well, I use a rice cooker. Okay. In a rice cooker, you don't have to. Like a rice cooker, it senses the pressure. I have a, it's called Zoji Rushi. I'm not a kitchen gadget guy, but the, the rice cooker changed my life. And I eat a lot of rice, and I eat a lot of grains, and the fact that I can put it in the rice cooker, push the button, and it does it is brilliant. Um, but, yeah, so, so some of these grains, for sure, and sorghum is one of those. It's, it can be really hard. So if you can soak it for a couple hours, drain that water out, it'll, it'll speed up your cooking time and it'll make it a little softer. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, millet. Um, I go to uh, Patel Brothers up in uh, – they have giant bags of millet, and – I only knew millet as one thing. There's lots of variety, just like quinoa. You can buy the, you know, the, the different colors, millet the same way, sorghum the same way. You, you can find variations in them. Uh, but this one I can buy at my local health food store. This is like $3, $4, um, and it is so good. Now, a lot of Southerners know of sorghum, uh, and sorghum is made from the cane. So the plant has a stalk. They extract the liquid of that. They boil it down. Sorghum syrup is from the same plant. But that's sweet, and it, it's high glycemic index, uh, so diabetics really can't do that. Um, but this is from the same plant, but this is the seed of that plant. Yeah, so exactly right. So with, with beans, you soak them overnight, um, and that, um, and I've forgotten, Emily, what's the, what's the word, and I'm not putting you on the spot, but I'm drawing a blank. The, the beans have on the coating, when you're soaking them, you're releasing less, less, no. Something with an L. Lectin, lectin. Is it lec lectin? Lectins, but lectins, 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 lectins. That's the word, lectins. And so you're, that can also cause some, some GI distress. And so by soaking overnight, every time you rinse them, you are exponentially reducing the amount of lectins that are in the beans. So yes, and then when you cook them, you, you, you drain the cooking water off. Even if you're making a soup. Excuse me, I got chili in my mouth now. Not bad. Um, so every time you rinse and drain them, you're reducing the level the level of that. So, rice, uh, rice so it depends on the variety. You know, uh, when I go to market, already pre rinsed some of them. You, if you want sticky rice, you don't want to rinse because there's that sort of not gluten, but it's glutinous. That kind of so like the purple rice. If you're making a, a sticky rice dessert, you wouldn't rinse it. If you want it to be loose like that, you would rinse it. So it just depends on, on the variety and what your intended use is. So, hope you enjoyed it. I did, thank you. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.